going to continue our study in the book of Romans. And specifically, we are now in the third section of the book of Romans that deals specifically with the restoration of the nation of Israel. That's a key thing for us to understand, dealing with the restoration of the nation of Israel, because of some things that transpired even this week. Okay? Regardless of what you may think, regardless of how any one of us may feel personally about the situation with uh, the Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu coming and speaking to Congress, there are some feelings because of the fact that uh, the President did not, this was not an agreed upon visit. However, when we get past all of the feelings, the reality is this. It was a very key event, and it's very key to what we're studying and what we have been studying. I could not have prepared our church better to receive that the, what is transpiring than what we have been going through for the past few months in our own study here as a church in the book of Romans in particular in Romans 9, 10, and 11. There is nothing that could have done more to prepare us for that. In a controversial speech to the U.S. Congress, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu warned the United States against paving the way for Iran to have bombs. We know that Israel, from all of our Old Testament study, and, and as we have observed them during the church age, Israel has never been had a bunch of friends. They have always had major, major <coughs> enemies. The United States has historically been a key ally to the nation of Israel. However, I believe that the stage is being set so that biblical prophecy will come true in that the entire world is going to turn its back on Israel. And I believe that in 2015, we are seeing that stage being set. You may not fully understand what's going on, but the stage is being set before our very eyes that we can see biblical prophecy being coming to light as it relates to the nation of Israel, not to the church. Okay? There are a lot of things happening, though, in the world that are part of what is impacting us as believers. This week, in New York City, the largest public school system in the United States, with approximately 1.1 million students, starting next year, will close the entire district, the entire New York City public school system. 1.1 million students are going to close to observe Muslim holiday. First time in history that Islam has come into the, our country and now is demanding an observance and they started with the largest public school system in the United States. Over the past seven days and this goes along with Romans 8 and the fact that the earth is groaning, waiting for the adoption. In the past seven days, just this past week, we have seen 1,360 cold weather records broken in the United States and the regions around the country. There have been cataclysmic events happening at a rate 
that should perk up the ears of every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ because we are seeing before our very eyes unlike any other time in history <laughs> prophecy being fulfilled or in the process of being fulfilled. Understand this. You and I as members of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are saved this morning, the only thing we're doing is listening for sound. Amen. That sound is the trumpet Amen. rapturing us up out of here. <laughs> and that's it. <clears throat> Every biblical prophecy as it relates to the church has been fulfilled with the exception of the rapture of the church, the, uh, the, the judgment seat of Christ, and coming back at the second coming for the millennial reign. So right now, what is happening is this. The kingdom of heaven is at hand as it relates to a Jew. And the kingdom of God is at hand as it relates to the church. <coughs> you and I have a front row seat. That speech by Benjamin Netanyahu this week set in motion the continuance of the end of our time here on earth as we know it. Preceding the rapture. For the past few months, as we have been going through this third section of the book of Romans, we have been looking at Israel as a nation. However, we have been looking and observing them as a rebellious nation that has been cut out of the olive tree because of their continued rebellion and their rejection specifically of the Lord Jesus Christ as their Jewish Messiah. And that's important to know. You know, oftentimes you'll hear people talk about how he's our Messiah. He's not our Messiah. He's our Savior. Amen. But he is Messiah to the nation of Israel. Paul explained to us the church, and, and, and he used a reference to us he called us a wild olive branch. And he says that we were grafted in, but the grafting in, what allowed us to be grafted into the olive branch, is not based off our merit, as opposed to the unbelief of the nation of Israel. He said that our grafting was an a, 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 in relation to their unbelief. And then he told us this in Romans chapter 11. He said in verse 19, he says, Thou wilt then say, say then, the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. He says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. And thou, we, stand by faith. So as a result of the faith that we now stand in, he, he gives a warning. He says, be not, he says, be not high-minded, but fear. So here's the thing, how it works. Right now, March, what's today? Eighth. Hey. <laughs> Is your birthday? Today's your birthday. Okay. That's I well, I'm not, no. no wonder she knows right. this. <laughs> happy birthday. We'll sing happy birthday to you. Okay. Right now, a privilege, even though it is a, a, a spiritual privilege, a, a spiritual olive branch has been extended to the Gentile church as a result of the unbelief of the Jew. As it says. Miss Simpson looking up, I'm pointing at the I get to see the screens in front. <laughs> so I don't have to point. Okay? <clears throat> the thing we don't want to be though is high minded because it's only because of their unbelief that we have this privilege. We need to take advantage of the privilege that we have 
Because again, and I laid this all out, you know, as Gentiles, we had no, we were dogs. We had no God. We had, they, the, everything we were to get was to come through them. But then because of their unbelief, God grafts us in and now he allows us, the Gentile church, to have the privilege that we have. Unfortunately, we don't take advantage of that privilege often. Amen. What we have to understand, though, is this. Even though Israel has been cut out of the olive tree, it would appear, and there are many people who believe, that their being cut out, God is finish with them. And that the church is now taking the place of the nation of Israel and all of the, and all that was intended for them has now been given to us. But here's the truth. God who cut them out is able to graft them in again. He is able to restore them. He, if he couldn't do that, he wouldn't be God. Even though Israel's been cut out, God is going to grab them in. Look at what, what it says here in Romans chapter 11, in verse 21 through 23. It says, For if God spared not the natural branches, that would be Israel, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. Okay? He didn't spare them. You better be careful high-minded Christians. Amen. If God cut them all, he'll cut you all. Amen. Behold, therefore, and we, I talked on this last week, on the goodness and severity of God. And we talked about the fact that God is not just a good God, but he's a severe God, too. He's a severe God in the sense that God is not mocked whatsoever you sow. Amen. Yeah, you're reaping, you're reaping. God will spank you. <laughs> it says on them which fell, severity, the nation of Israel. But towards thee right now, it's goodness. He says, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief, watch this, he says, shall be grafted in, for God, why, is able to graft them in again. God had cut them off. God is God, and God can do as he pleases, especially concerning his children. It is within God's power to restore Israel back to their rightful position. That is why Paul said this in verse 24 of Romans chapter 11. He said, for if thou were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good tree, how much more shall these, which be the natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? If God would, in other words, we the church are wild by nature. We're this wild branch that was grafted into this good olive tree. And God took this wild branch, he grafted us in, it was in God's power to do so. And if that is the case, if God can take a wild branch and graft it into a good tree, can he not take a natural branch that was cut out of the good tree and graft them back into their own tree? Yes, he can. Does not God have the power to do that? Yes, he does. Can he not bring them back? And again, and I took you guys through, through the different, uh, I hate to even call them denominational. There are different church groups, New Testament Gentile church groups, who clearly believe that God is done with Israel. Some of them even meet on the Sabbath, believing that the Sabbath is for the church. Some of them even have taken on the role of the nation of Israel in adhering 
sometimes to the dietary laws and the different laws that are in respect to them because they believe that now God is dealing with us and no longer is he dealing with them and will not deal with them. Instead of understanding that not when God when God went and started using the Apostle Paul to reach Gentiles and establish the Gentile church, it was a totally different dispensation. It's a whole new thing. He didn't take one to replace the other. He's taken one because God, here's the reason. They were going to reach you, Gentile, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Salvation was going to come through them. But because God has, God got this. He's worked this thing out. He just raised up a man named Saul who was killing us, changed his name to Paul, used him to plant churches, established several churches, and wrote all of the letters that we now study and is using us. But he's coming. He, he, he has to go back to Israel, and you guys that have been here, you fully understand this. He has to use Israel. He cannot not use Israel. You know why? Because he promised them that he would, and he can't go back on it. He cannot go back on it. You have to understand that. He will not just cut them off and leave them off. It is based on a promise that he made to Abraham through Isaac and Jacob and the 12 tribes of Israel. Ultimately, David and you know, through the Lord Jesus, you know, it goes on and on. Okay? So, does not God have the power to graft Israel back in? Absolutely he does. Is, is God capable of grafting in again Israel, the natural branch, back into its own tree? Absolutely he can Yes, he is capable, and not only is God capable, but he is going to do it. So now, as we continue our study today, <coughs> Paul having shown us that it is within God's power to restore Israel, is going to also show this, that it's within God's purpose to do it too. So we pick up this morning where we left off, at verse 25. And he says this. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits. I love it. I love the, the verbiage of that. Let me tell you why that's important. If you're, if you're a student of the Bible, immediately there's two things that ought to perk up to you. When you read that, verse 25a. Okay? Now we come to not only the most interesting and key verses in the book of Romans. This verse 25, if 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 you were to take the book of Romans, it hinges. Uh, all right, let, let me rephrase that. If you were to take the third section, <clears throat> okay, nine verse chapters 9, 10, and 11. Okay, and hang them on something, you would hang them on verse 25. Okay? Because it's a key verse to, to that section of Romans. Okay? It is one of the most interesting verses in Scripture because it deals specifically with the restoration of the nation of Israel. Or you might want to write in your Bible if you're taking notes, you might want to put in there either the restoration of the nation of Israel or the salvation of Israel. It's interesting because of the context in which it is written. As we previously studied in our Wednesday night Bible study, and if you don't regularly attend Wednesday night Bible study, you, I would take even better notes here uh, because you need to understand this. And, and, and for our visitors, I want you to please understand what I'm getting ready to say. And, and unless you have a KJV, you won't get this. 
because it doesn't read the same. Okay? There are seven things that you're called to not be ignorant of. Seven. There are seven things that, you, that it says, I would not have you to be ignorant of. Now, it doesn't read that in other <coughs> texts. Okay? But there are seven things that we're called to not be ignorant of. This is one of them. Now, <coughs> also in Scripture, there are seven mysteries in, for the New Testament church. This verse is one of them. <coughs> so it's a twofold meaning in that there are seven things you're not to be ignorant of. We're not only to be ignorant of this, but this is a mystery that we're not to be ignorant of. Okay? As a matter of fact, you and I are told this in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. He says, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Let me explain something to you. Not only are you supposed to know Romans 11, 25, but there is an accountability for you to know 11 to 25 because we as New Testament believers are stewards of the mysteries of which Romans 11 25 is one of them. You better have this in your Bible somewhere because you're going to stand before the Lord accountable for your stewardship over this mystery. said that we should not be ignorant of this mystery and the reason that we're not to be ignorant is, is lest you should be wise he says in your own conceits in other words if, if you for one second think that God is through with Israel then you run the danger of being ignorant and conceited it's what it said in Proverbs of a rich man. Look at what it says in Proverbs 28, 11. He says this. The rich man is wise in his own conceit. He used the same terminology that he uses in Romans eleven twenty five. 25. The rich man's problem is this. And this is most rich people. If you ever been around rich, you know, rich folk. And I ain't talking... Rich in the, I'm talking rich rich. I ain't talking, well, Michael Jordan's rich now. I guess he's good. Man. But, uh, <laughs> the problem with rich people is that he looks down at the poor man because of his riches. He thinks that he is better than the poor man, that he has something that the poor man does not have, Jesus called the nation of Israel poor in spirit. In the church age, though, you and I have a problem. The problem is what John said of our entire period of church history, or the, the period that we call the Laodicean church age. And look at what he said in Revelation 3.18. He says, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. We live in a very rich period of history. There's more wealth in this, in this world. They just came out with the new Forbes you know, that's how they realized that Michael Jordan was a billionaire. You know, they came out with the new list of wealthy people. They said that the billionaires represent 1% uh, of the world's wealth. 1% billionaires do. The world's wealth. But, but as it read, you know, people like y'all, 
<laughs> Amen. People like us. See, I'm rich in spirit. That's all right. Amen. You know, poor folks like us, we represent the, the, the majority of people in the world. They only represent 1%. And they're billionaires. And there's a whole bunch of them. And here's the thing in this country. Everybody in here smells good and looks good and drove here. You realize that we are wealthier than 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 vast vast amount of people in the world. We're not Michael Jordan rich. We're not Warren Buffett rich. But here's our problem: we think that what we have even looks down on sometimes our own neighbor. And, he, and, and, and what John was saying here is that you think you have something? Don't you realize that outside of Christ that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked? Yes. We think we have something. We have nothing outside of Christ That's right. and Christ alone. That's we have right. nothing. That's right. We have absolute. We are nothing. That's right. But Paul says this in Romans 11. He says if we're not careful and we get it twisted concerning Israel, there is a danger of being conceited. The reason that we become conceited is because we think that we have something when we are nothing, listen to this, as it relates to the nation of Israel. In this church age, we think that God has cast them off, and now we're it. So we run the danger of thinking that we have something, they are nothing. And let me tell you something. There is an anti-Semitic <coughs> attitude in this country against Jews. There is. And you run the risk of being conceited and thinking that we're something when you better go back to Genesis 12 where God said, I will bless them that bless thee and I will curse them that curse thee. Let me tell you something. This country sits under a blessing right now. The United States as a whole. Do you realize why? We are an ally to the nation of Israel. Do you realize the countries that have turned their back on the nation of Israel? You know the majority of them. Do you know where they live at? They live in dirt and dust. They, they, they drink the same waters that their cows are in. And they hate, they will turn a scud missile against the nation of Israel so quick, it'll make your head spin. Because they hate Israel. And you know what God said? I'll bless them that bless thee, Israel, and I will curse them that curses Israel. And these countries live under a curse. They live in, there's a handful of them are rich. Oh, they're the, and the ones that are rich, they are really rich. But the rest of them, they are dirt, dirt, dirt poor. They are dirt poor. Hear me. In the name of Allah, oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In some of them, um, some of these countries. They are dirt, filthy dirt poor. I'm telling you, they are filthy. And you know why? They don't believe this book. They don't believe the God of this book. They thrown Christ out and they hate Israel. It's the way it is. God said we were on a danger church age of falling into that same category as it relates to the nation of Israel. You know why? Because God cut them off as natural branches, but don't think for a second he's not able to graft them in again. And he will. He just has to bring them through the tribulation to graft them in. The reason that we become conceited is we think we have something. The truth is that we're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Our grafting is because of their unbelief, and their unbelief is only temporary. <coughs> don't get it twisted. Now, what is the mystery that he says that, we, that, that we're to be 
ministers of? What is this mystery that you and I as members of the church are not to be ignorant of? He says this in the second half of Romans chapter 11 verse 25. He said, here's what you did, what you're, the mystery. That blindness in part is happened to Israel. And that only until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Israel, right now, Israel in most of the worlds, they're hated. But they're no one. But I want you to think about something. They're the only country in the world that has been at war since its inception. Yet they still survive. Where are the parasites right now? Where are the Jebusites? Where are they? They don't exist. Most of the nations that Israel fought in the Old Testament, they don't even exist anymore. Yet Israel stands. Yes, they do. <coughs> and you know what? We better have the right heart attitude towards Israel. I'm telling you this. No, no, no. Let me tell you what happened this week. Okay? Because the primary group of people that boycotted uh, Netanyahu's speech was the Congressional Black Caucus. They all stood out, Cleaver included. And I'm saying it, I know he's the preacher right here. He refused to go. You know what? You know what their problem was? They don't understand Romans chapter 11. They don't understand Genesis chapter 12. You better be careful with your, with your attitude towards Israel. You don't want to be on the wrong side of history, President Obama, as it relates to Israel. You do not want to be on the wrong side of history Amen. as it relates to Israel. Right. You better be careful. Right. God doesn't play. Amen. <laughs> well, you think he was kidding when he said, I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee? You think that he only said that as a joke? Israel, as a people, right now, in 2015, is blind. They're blind to the reality of who Christ, they rejected Messiah, they rejected him. Messianic Jews, as they call them, but as a people, they're still waiting for him to come. They don't believe that the God that they crucified, they don't believe he was Christ. They don't believe it at all. If they did, they'd become Christians. <laughs> but here's the thing. That blindness is because of their unbelief. Israel is blind spiritually as a nation, but that blindness is only in part. Blindness is what happened to Israel when they, as, as a nation, rejected Christ. So when you look at Israel, God has always dealt with them as a nation, but now in the New Testament, you know what he's dealing with? We get to deal with them on, he deals with us on an individual basis. Hear me. That's why the Lord's Prayer, which is not for the New Testament church, says, Our Father which art in heaven. And you again, you guys have been here know that we say Abba Father because he's our daddy. We have a personal relationship with him. They had a national relationship with him. They had to come to them. They, they had to go through a priest. I don't go through no priest. I go directly to the throne of grace. Amen. On my own. Amen. Me. Mortal me. Amen. I don't have to go through Moses. I don't have to go through anybody. Go directly to Christ. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> This blindness that they have, though, is not so much spiritual blindness, also as judicial blindness, caused by the rejection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 9 through 11 do something. They provide for us a concise outline of God's dealing with Israel. And here's the reason. Israel was going to be restored. Look at what it says in Daniel chapter 2. It says this, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed 
and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. But it shall break in pieces and consume all of these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. You understand what he's saying here, Daniel? Right now, we are, we're under Gentile rule. But God's going to set up a kingdom. <clears throat> that kingdom will be called the millennial kingdom. The millennial reign of Christ. God is going to set up a kingdom. It won't be any end to it. God is going to set that kingdom up and no, other, no Gentile nations will have rule over Israel in that kingdom. He's going to restore Israel because the issue has been and will always be the theme of the Bible. And what is the theme of the Bible, Craig? The second coming and the establishment of the kingdom. It is not Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ on the throne. Okay? God is going to set up his kingdom called the kingdom of heaven. A physical, literal kingdom that is part of the promise that he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who is Israel. And his 12 sons, who represent the 12 tribes of Israel. That kingdom will be established during the time called the millennial reign of Christ, when Christ and rule will rule and reign physically and literally from the city of Jerusalem, from a temple that will be established in the city of Jerusalem. Isaiah put it this way. This is what he said in Isaiah chapter 9. He said, for unto us a child is born. You know what that is? That's the first coming of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Look at what he says second. Unto us a son is given. You know what that is? That's the second coming of Christ. He came as a baby in a manger. He's coming back as the son of God. It says, and, and what's going to happen then? The government is going to be on his shoulders. His name then, during that millennial reign, will be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And it says this of it, of the increase of his government, and what's the next word? Peace. We don't have peace. We don't live in peace. The world has never, tell me one time that the world has been in peace. Name it. <clears throat> Other than when, when, when Adam came and before he ate in the garden. From the, from the millisecond that Adam and Eve ate of the tree, there's been nothing but chaos. The world's never been in peace. But guess what's going to happen when Christ comes back? For the first time in history, there will be peace. There will be peace like we've never seen before. Listen, a world, a world peace. It says, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the whole, look at what he said. He said he's going to perform this. It's going to happen. God is going to set it up. We haven't seen it yet. Israel will be restored even though they may be in the position and condition that they are in 2015. Look at what it says in Daniel chapter 7. It says this. He says, I saw in the, in the night visions and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, all nations, and all languages should serve him. That's not happening right now. People don't serve him. Christ, people hate Christ. And they hate us because we love him. But not then. Not when this kingdom gets established. 
His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, that, that which shall not be destroyed. Let me tell you something. Every rule, you have to go back in history. Where's the, where's the Roman rule right now? Roman, Rome fell. England was one of the biggest world powers in history. What is England run right now? Nothing. You look at the Persian rule, incredible historically. What's Persia right now? Which is Iran. Do they run anything? No. But let me tell you something. When Christ comes back, here's the good thing. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you get to reign alongside of them. Amen. Man, I'm listening for a sound. I'm telling you, because it's almost time, guys. It's almost time for us to check up out of here. It is. Our time, the time is at hand. It's right now. Look at what he says in Ezekiel chapter 37. He says, And I say unto you, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will take the children of Israel from among the heathen, whether they be gone, and will gather them on every side and bring them where? And we ain't talking about the Gaza Strip either. <coughs> they get a whole lot more. They get their land. It was promised to him. God's got to give it to him. He says that I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel. They get the, they're going to come in as one group. He says that one king shall be king to them all. And they shall be no more two nations. Neither shall they be divided into two kingdoms anymore at all. Neither shall they defile themselves anymore with their idols, <clears throat> nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But he, look at what he says. <clears throat> but I will save them out of all their dwelling place wherein they have sinned and will cleanse them. So shall they be my people and I will be their God. You know what? That's prophetic to what's going to happen to the nation of Israel when they come back into their land. We're waiting on that day. Hadn't happened yet. <laughs> the Jews have never been restored but once. And that was from Babylon. What happened in 1948 was not a restoration of the nation of Israel. They only received a, a small piece of dirt. The march from Egypt to Canaan was not a restoration. You cannot have anything restored to you unless it has been your possession before. And Palestine was never in possession of the children of Israel until after the conquest by Joshua. Again, the Jews are to come this time not from the east. And when they return, from the Babylonian, as when they did return from Babylonian captivity, but this time they're going to come from the north and from all countries. Look at what it says in Jeremiah 16. He says, "Therefore, and some of you guys need to come to a Bible study more. You can catch up on this quicker. Therefore, behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that it shall." No more be said, the Lord liveth that bringeth up the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, which is south. But the Lord liveth that brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands whither he had driven them. And I will bring them again into their land that I give unto their fathers. I'm not going to go into Gog and Magog and what happens. But let me tell you another country you better keep eye on. Keep your eye on what happens with Putin and, and, and the Ukrainian countries that are north of Israel. Keep an eye on what happens with Russia. Just tell me. I'll teach it on a Wednesday night. I hate to say that. It's just too hard to teach on a Sunday. 
when we, there's, there's some major teaching dealing with what comes down from the north. Okay? Here's the thing, and this is the main thing that you need to understand. God is going to restore Israel. He's going to bring them in again. He's going to restore them again in the land. He's going to perform that. And we are seeing it set up before our very eyes. Look at what it says in Isaiah 43. He says, Fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west, and I will say to the north, Give up, and to the south, Keep not back. Bring my sons from far and my daughters from the ends of the earth, every one that is called by my name, for I have cre created him for my glory. I have formed him, yet <coughs> I have made him. God's going to bring him back. Amen. When a Jew accepts Christ as his, his Savior today, what happens? He becomes a member of the church. Okay? Okay. They enter into the body of Christ. They receive all of the blessings that are bestowed on the individual members of the body of Christ. Otherwise, they are looked upon as members nationally called the nation of Israel. As a nation, as a group, Israel is blind. That blindness has allowed us to enter into this period called the fullness of the Gentiles. Okay? Even though I covered this before, let me go back over this, the, these two terms that we look at. Okay? First, let's look at the times of the Gentiles. Found in Luke chapter 21, verse 24. It says this, And they shall fall by the edge of the sword, and they shall be led away captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The times of the Gentiles. You want to make sure you have this. Some of you should be able to get up here and teach this. Is a period during which Jerusalem or Israel is now under Gentile power, watch this, politically. <coughs> Obama's in charge of, 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 of Israel. But Netanyahu answers to him, so to speak. Netanyahu don't answer to many people. Don't be surprised if Netanyahu loses this election too on Tuesday. Or don't be surprised if when he if if he wins and doesn't get assassinated or something. That his his because when his reign comes to an end, that's it. He's the last one. I've proven that when I laid out you guys that have been here, well, because I laid out to you the difference between the, the the prime ministers and and the judges, remember? Right? And I laid them out side by side. <coughs> Netanyahu's the last one. He's it. He, he represents it. Now, he's running for office, and that, that election is on Tuesday. And if he wins, we'll get however many more years left. I think it's coming to an end. I think it's, it's over. Uh, but he may win. How long he holds office, I don't know. He could die of sickness or something. But when the next one comes in, if he's not someone who was in office from before, guys, we're in trouble. Things change. Okay? But let me talk about this times of the Gentiles. This period began with the rule of Nebuchadnezzar in 606 BC and will continue until the return of the Lord, or this or uh, actually it will end at the rapture of the church. Because Gentile, the Gentile church is gone. We're, gone. We're out of here. There's no more Gentile rule. Now, it actually, Gentiles will still probably be in charge during the tribulation period. Okay? But the, the, everything changes. The whole rules change. You guys need to understand the tribulation, how it all works. Obama or, or Hillary, and Hillary would probably be in office maybe at that time. <laughs> they have absolutely no idea what, what's going on here. They, they, they just are oblivious to the entire thing. They just have no idea. Uh, and I love the guy. 
You know, but he has absolutely no idea when it comes to what we're talking about here. This is different. This is, you know, this has nothing to do with you biking personally or not. Okay? Okay? <clears throat> Christ, is, we talked about this, is going to literally reign from the throne in the city of Jerusalem as king of kings. Again, let me show you again what Isaiah said in verse 7. He said, of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David, upon his kingdom. Right? To order. He's going to do it. God's going to set it up. Okay? There will be a governmental rule that for the first time establishes peace on planet earth and Christ will literally sit upon the throne of David in the city of Jerusalem. The kingdom of heaven will be established and for the first time in history as we know it, the land will be governed, ruled, and established with judgment and justice. Where the word of the Lord, this book, is going to be the constitution. Everything runs through this thing. No matter what every country's little rules and regulations are, everything gets governed by the book. Amen. Amen. Finally, it's the only time it's going to be some peace when this book is ruling and reigning. This book isn't ruling and reigning in people's lives. We live in the days of judges. There's no king in Israel, and every man is doing that which is right in his own eyes. Right? So when Christ sets up this rule, the book is going to... That'll be it. This is how the world's going to be run through this book. Praise the Lord. That's the only hope we have. Otherwise, you're hoping that the right laws get passed and that the laws are upheld and that... And that the people, you know, I told these kids this the other day at the barbershop. I said, let me explain something to you about the police. Police, you, we call them the law. They're not the law. We have a law, and they are called to enforce the law. Yeah. The problem is, they enforce their own law. When Christ comes back, <coughs> you don't have to worry about police. Everything gets run to the book. Because this is the law. Man. This is what'll run. Whole country will run. You can you don't have to read this book now. Amen. But if I were you, I'd be and especially if you aren't saved, I'd be trying to get familiar with it. <laughs> so you will know what's what's gonna rule and reign you. Right now, we live in the times of the Gentiles where Gentile kings are ruling and reigning over the land and Israel, watch this is dependent upon the United States as an ally. They need us. They need us. Netanyahu came, came to Congress this week, let me tell you, he was lobbying. That's not gonna, they, gonna, they won't need that when, when Christ is in charge. They don't need a Gentile nation to be their, to be their help. God never intended for the nation of Israel to, to, to be dependent upon other people. But here's the problem. Because of their unbelief, God is allowing Gentile nations to now rule politically over the nation of Israel. Now, there's a second term. It's called the fullness of the Gentiles says this in, in our verse that we're studying today, right? He says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness is in part is happening to, to Israel until when? The fullness of the different from the times of the Gentiles, right? It's different only in this sense. The times of the Gentiles represent political reign, the fullness of the Gentiles represents spiritual reign. The church is over Israel spiritually. We were supposed to get salvation through them. Guess how they get salvation now? Through us. Jew wants anything, he needs to get saved. Just because he's a Jew doesn't make him special. He better get saved. If he dies in his sin, because they rejected Christ, where does he go? He busts the gates of hell wide open. 
His Jewishness means absolutely nothing. Yes. Just because he's a Jew. means nothing. Why? Because we're in the time called the fullness of the Gentiles. We are in charge. We, we, we have the book, old and new. We have the Holy Spirit. We have the local church. We have the voice that we're to be proclaiming. We have the ministry of reconciliation. We can reconcile a Jew back to his God. Because he's cut out. Temporarily. He's cut out. Because of his unbelief. And we get to reconcile him back to God. That is the fullness of the Gentiles. But he said this. Israel's only bond in part until that time comes to an end. And the fullness of the Gentiles can listen to me. Ding dong. It is the bell is ringing. You better make sure you're saved right now. Because the fullness of our time is about full. It's almost up. We had seven periods of church history. From the apostolic period until the Laodicean church that we're in right now. Guys, it's over. You want to know how you know it's over? As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. Where did Lot live? <coughs> Sodom and Gomorrah, where we get sodomy from. You know what is the, 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 what's the news of the day? Whether or not your rights to sodomize somebody should be legal or not. And get married behind it. Guys, it's over. You better be winning people to Christ. And if you're not winning people to Christ, you need to be, you need to get saved. Amen. Right now. It's up. We're busy playing tiddlywinks. <laughs> y'all, some of y'all don't even know what tiddlywinks are. <laughs> <laughs> It's over. It's coming to an end. It's drawing near. You know when the fullness of the Gentiles is over, right? What are we? Who are we replacing every time we get saved? The angels, right? So you know what happens in the fullness of the Gentiles? What happens is this. One by one, since Christ, after the thief on the cross, right? The thief on the cross would be the last one who went to paradise, right? Because... No one in the Old Testament went to heaven. They went to paradise. Christ goes, sets them free, looses them, right? They come out, of, of, and, and they now, from that point forward, people can get saved. And guess what started happening? People started being entered into the time, the fullness of the Gentile. But guess what? It's almost full. You know when, when it's going to end? When the last Gentile, when the last person, Gentile, Jew or Gentile, right, gets saved. You might, wouldn't it be nice if you was the one that led the last person to Christ? <laughs> and all of a sudden you heard the trumpet sound. <laughs> he said, I trust you, uh, Father, I know that I'm a sinner. My sin is separated from you. Lord, I ask you to send your spirit to let, let da, 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 you know? <laughs> The last Gentile got saved. You led them to Christ. They got saved in the fullness of the Gentiles. It was full. And you know when the saints go marching in, oh how I want to be in that number. God has a number. And that number, and we get, he said we're adding to it every day. You want to be a part of that. You gonna stand accountable for that? But boy, I, I pray. That's why I'm trying to lead people to Christ. I want to be the last guy and one of the last person to Christ. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. Now I may not win, like you know how you win the, the, the big prize. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to be the last guy to win the last person to Christ. And then the fullness of the Gentiles <clears throat> we come in. We're full. That's it. We're done. It's over. <sighs> Look at what it says in Romans. We continue in Romans. The next verse it says in verse 26. What happens next? 
after the fullness of the Gentiles. So the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Everybody gets saved. He says this. And so all Israel shall be shut. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion, hallelujah, the deliverer. Why? We ought to make a movie. The deliverer. Right? Behold, he comes riding on the cloud. Shining like the sun at the trumpet call. Right? He's coming. We should have said, we need to sing that next week. <laughs> Right? He says, There shall come out of Zion a deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. For this is my covenant. You know why? Let me tell you why he says Jacob and not Israel. You know why? <coughs> Think about it for a second. He says that they're gonna ungodliness is gonna come from Jacob. Because you know what Jacob represents when it comes to Israel? The man side, the the, the human side of Israel. So that's why when Jacob's name was changed to Israel, his name vacillated back between Jacob and Israel, right? But in, in Genesis chapter 50, it says that they embalmed Israel, right? Into eternal security. Because even though he kept wanting to be Jacob, he was rebellious. He, Jacob meets supplanter. He was rebellious as Jacob. And guess who God's going to turn ungodliness away from? The bad Israel. The unbelieving Israel. Right? The stiff-necked Israel. Right? He says, For well, this is my covenant to them when I should take away their sin. God is going to come. Who is this deliverer that's going to come out of Zion? None other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. You need to know this. When he comes back, we come back with him. Because this is the second coming of Jesus Christ. We'll have been raptured out and we get sent through the judgment seat of Christ and we get all of that God is going to give for us for what you're doing now. You're earning your stripes. Some of you will be privates. I'm trying to be a four star. <laughs> right? I want to be a five star. They only get one five star during, the, during wartime. And we're at war, guys. It's a spiritual war, and you're earning your stripes right now. Some of us, though, you know what? We, some of us haven't even made it out of basic training. <laughs> I'm trying to be a general. I want to stand before him. Well done, now, good people. <laughs> you know why? Because I did what I was supposed to do. Because I kept the faith. I finished my course. Amen. I want to finish my course. Some of us never finish anything that we ever start. We never finish. God wants you to finish this thing. Let's finish. You know how you do Let's finish it. Let's get this thing done. Amen? As a church. Let's go together. Let's do all this together. If the church happens, if the rapture happens on a Sunday morning, let's all check out of here together. Amen. And be standing right in front of him. All of us. Ready. Because we did our job. We served him with all our heart. We gave him everything we had. That's how we want to stand before him. You want to stand before him and you hiding over in a corner naked and ashamed because you ain't do nothing. You busy <coughs> worried about something else. Busy worried about whatever. Don't laugh, my son. <laughs> but here's the thing. He says that all Israel is going to be saved. He doesn't mean all Israel in, in a sense that he's already talked about the fact that there's only going to be a remnant of Israel saved. Look at what it says in Zechariah 12. He says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Israel the spirit of grace and supplication. And they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Come on, this is Zechariah preaching about the Lord Jesus Christ before the Lord Jesus Christ was even made flesh. He says, and they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, and shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. In that day, there shall be a great mourning in Jerusalem, as the mourning of, somebody pronounced the word, in the valley of Megiddo. It goes on and says in verse 12, 
and the land shall mourn, every family apart, the family of the house of David apart, and their wives apart, the family of the house of Nathan apart, and their wives apart, the family of Levi apart, and their wives apart, the family of Shimei apart, their wives apart, and all the families that remain, every family apart, and their wives apart, are going to mourn. You know what? Because then, because Israel, here's what you have to understand something. This period, this tribute that Israel is going to go through? You don't want to be here. You don't want to be here during the tribulation. It's going to be a time of mourning. You better get saved. This ain't no time to be playing around. Let me explain something. God has a plan for Israel. We're part of that plan. We're part of that plan in this sense. Okay? We should be preparing the hearts of people for the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The rapture takes place first. The tribulation takes during seven years. At the end of tribulation, the, the, the Christ comes back. We come back with him. Here's my question to you. If Christ comes back right now, Amen. I'm talking right now. Amen. Where are you going? Hallelujah. Where are you going to be? If you have to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ, how are you going to stand at the judgment? What's he going to say to you? If he were to take your life right now and run it through a little reel, what would you, what, 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 what would it see? What was your life? What's the movie that plays out of your life? Is it a drama? Is it a trilogy? Or is it a horror story? <laughs> is it a comedy? What kind of movie is your life? How would it play itself out? What would it be? Would it be a love story? Or would it be a movie about spiritual adultery? Hmm. Hear me, because you played the whore on Jesus Christ. You weren't married to him. You only fake like him. How would, you, how would your relationship be? What would happen? You've heard me say this before. If every dollar that you spend, and you know currency has a face on it, right? If every coin, every penny, if Abraham Lincoln could speak for you and say what you spent him on, if Benjamin Franklin could speak and say what you spent, what would be said? Would you spend your money on? Would you do for Christ? Let's pray.